Yep. Yes, we can hear you. All right, cool, cool. All right, so my name is Gabrielle Hines. Um, I just recently received my master's in education and uh, was recently hired as a school counselor with the School of Entrepreneurship and Technology. Um, and today I'll be presenting my thesis. Uh, the, uh, the title of my thesis is called The Life and Times of an Educated Gangsta, a study of former and current gang members as they navigate through America's educational system. Um, so before I present, I just kind of want to share my inspiration, you know, for my topic. Um, I come from a gang family and I grew up in neighborhoods that are considered gang infested. Um, so I know firsthand that not all gang members are criminals, um, but just individuals who are proud to be from the neighborhoods and the communities that they come from. Uh, below is a picture of me and some of my cousins, as well as a picture of me and my husband, um, all individuals who are gang affiliated. Um, also, as I reflect on my childhood, I was not inspired in school. And, you know, that was just not my narrative, but that was the narrative of everyone around me. Um, a lot of the gang members um, in my family and in my community, you know, they have good hearts, they have dreams, aspirations and potential. Um, but unfortunately, as we know, not everyone is given the proper resources and opportunities to thrive. Um, and then, you know, as I got to college, um, I majored in uh, sociology. And uh, it kind of gave me a language to explain, uh, you know, the neighborhoods that I grew up in and why people from my community are expected to fail, you know, and, and just looking at uh, our trajectory in life and, and why people outside our neighborhoods we, were becoming doctors, nurses, uh, teachers, and, and people in my neighborhoods, you know, were expected to fail. And my cousins, my brothers, my sisters were going off to prison and not having those same outcomes. So um, pretty much my life experiences, you know, kind of shaped my passion and, and uh, you know, focus of my thesis. Um, so I'll kind of just go through it, um, starting with my introduction. Um, so unfortunately, you know, looking at the research, you know, there's not a lot of uh, people doing things for gang members. And, um, you know, there's just not a lot of, of information out there. Uh, so a lot of my uh, research um, focused on um, challenging the viewpoints, um, you know, of the assumptions in society, um, whether that's the mainstream media or the police, you know, that uh, paints, uh, you know, a picture of gang members as violent criminals, um, criminal organizations, you know, these individuals deserve to be locked up, go to prison, you know, there's no redemptive value, you know, we need to keep these individuals off the streets. They're kind of at the bottom of society, you know, and we all know that um, college completion and degree attainment can positively impact a person's trajectory in life. Um, but unfortunately, what I found was um, youth who joined gangs were 30% less likely to graduate from high school and 58% less likely to earn a four year degree than their matched counterpart. Um, and then this picture down here is a picture of uh, Dr. Rios, he's a sociology professor at UC Santa Barbara. And uh, these are some of the youth that he mentors. And um, I just thought the picture represented, you know, how um, gangs are criminalized in our society or, or just communities of colors. You know, people would look at this picture and assume that they're gang affiliated, um, that they're drinking and, and really they're just drinking um, Arizona iced tea. Um, so this leads me into, you know, the purpose of my study and the importance of my study. Uh, um, so the purpose of my study, you know, was to provide an alternative narrative about gang affiliated individuals and also identify the challenges that gang affiliated individuals face, you know, when pursuing higher education so educators can better serve this population. And uh, this leads me into the importance of uh, my study. So um, the purpose of my study was to provide an alternative perspective and challenge um, how individuals, you know, um, think about gangs. So to rethink how we, uh, how gangs are defined, um, it is only by changing the way educators view and treat this population that we can hope to increase college rates and reduce the rates of individuals returning to prison. Um, so in my research, you know, in my thesis, uh, I tried to, uh, can you guys give me one second? I'm sorry. Uh, so in my research, I tried to uh, answer three questions. 
Um, our first uh, research question was, what are the obstacles associated with former and current gang members seeking a higher education? Uh, my second uh, research question was, what factors contribute to former and current gang members' persistence and success in education? And my third research question was, what can educators and community organizations do to help former and current gang members, uh, students succeed in higher education? Um, so next I will look at uh, my literature review and just provide a brief overview. Um, so I started off my literature review just kind of looking at how um, uh, communities of color have been criminalized. So I start real general and then uh, youth focus. And then I kind of look at how um, gangs have been defined and gangs in education. And then the impact of a post-secondary post education degree has on gang affiliated individuals. Um, so, you know, like I said, I start real general and um, that's just kind of looking at, um, I start off looking at how, you know, uh, Native Americans were um, labeled as savages. I look at the three strikes, uh, the war on drugs, um, and then I go to youth focus, you know, just kind of looking at this um, new tool of criminal justice oppression, you know, they can lock more people up and they do that through the label of gangs. Um, because you are a gang member, they can target you a different way. You know, they don't need a reason to pull you over. Uh, they could be more aggressive with you, you know, uh, put your hands up, you know, they they search you. Uh, where are you going? And, and this is what um, Dr. Robert J. Duran calls legitimized oppression, you know, this war um, on our communities. And it's crazy because um, gangs, you know, started to help us. We became the biggest tool to come down on us. Uh, sorry, my son's in the background crying. Um, and then I look at um, the literature on how uh, gangs were defined. So Frederick Thrasher is the first sociologist credited um, to define gangs. And uh, he defined a gang as a group that came together to address issues of marginalization and social inclusion. And Brother Tone and Barrios, you know, have a similar definition. And then over time, the definition changed to be more criminal-like. However, the sociologists in my uh, research argue that the focus on crime does not capture the historical conditions and the inequality that make gangs emerge. Um, uh, next, my literature review focuses on gang affiliated youth and education. Um, so looking at the literature, um, we know that the school to prison pipeline and zero tolerance policies pushes students of color out of um, you know, school. Um, and if you look at it, it started with gang affiliated youth. Um, and then I found another uh, research study um, where schools you know, were unwelcoming spaces. Um, this study was uh, a study done um, uh, looking at 13 uh, Latin, uh, Latinx Latino uh, youth and um, basically what they found was that they were over-disciplined, um, that they faced dismissive attitudes, so that, that there was a lack of connection and that school personality, personnel uh, you know, made them feel intellectually incapable. Um, all of these uh, students were on track to graduate from high school and all were gang affiliated. Um, and then also what I found in my research was, um, you know, uh, Dr. Rios, he does a lot of work with uh, gang affiliated youth and mentors them and, and he found that all, you know, basically all we need is a small amount of resources um, and gang affiliated individuals can be successful. Um, and then also I found a study that, uh, you know, it's crazy that we're still talking about this 2021, but with culturally responsive practices, we can support gang affiliated youth. Um, and then this uh, wasn't really research, but what I found was like current efforts that supported gang affiliated youth um, in education. And, um, you know, honestly, there's very uh, few organizations that um, are supporting gang affiliated individuals, but I did find an organization called Boston Uncornered. And um, what they do is provide college uh, for all students who are gang affiliated. Um, and they have a college readiness advisor who is also gang affiliated. So they hire current gang members um, and, and they see them as the solution to mentor, you know, other gang members and they provide weekly stipends um, and they kind of used um, data in their community to see, you know, how these um, individuals could basically go to school um, and not have to work. 
and um, they're credited with the cre decreasing recidivism rates for over 80% of the former participating gang members. Um, and then uh, Dr. Rios and Dr. Duran are individuals that I cite a lot in my research. Um, they both are known uh, gang experts in the field and uh, were gang members and are sociology professors. And then um, this is just information, um, kind of how I, um, you know, uh, did my study. So my uh, framework was uh, a narrative inquiry. Uh, so basically, I wanted to do a study um, that was different from everyone else's, and um, not really research. Um, you know, uh, most of the literature is like focused on people. People are researching the community, but they're not connected to the community. Um, so I wanted to focus on individuals' lived experiences. You know, Master Cody in his book said there are no gang experts except members, you know. Um, so I really wanted to get as much gang members as I could to interview. Um, and, uh, you know, I did interviews. I interviewed seven individuals who were gang affiliated um, and only one former gang member. And then um, this ethical considerations was just stuff I had to do for my paper and and. The main thing that I really tried to do was not have biases when I uh, interviewed people, um, biases that you know society holds uh, when interviewing uh, the people that I interviewed. Um, so these are the people that I interviewed. Um, all were gang affiliated. Um, I only had one person who identified as a former gang member. All of the individuals that I interviewed are currently in college or have graduated recently. Um, I have, uh, everyone has been formally incarcerated except for one, and the majority have uh, been to community college except for one. And uh, I interviewed uh, camp uh, community members and campus-based activists, so individuals who um, work with gang members. Um, Will Dunn was, is actually a gang member who's a college readiness advisor at Boston and Cornered. Um, I interviewed professors and, and the director of Underground Scholars. And this is just more information on how I um, analyze my data. Um, so this is more like for my paper. Um, but um, I had a lot of, of data to work with. Uh, I didn't use everything that I came up with um, because my paper would have just been too long. And uh, my professor was like, um, you got to stay focused. Um, there were themes that I wanted to include um, that I didn't include, include, but uh, maybe that'll be a later project. Um, so basically, I kind of just trying to find the most common themes that related to my research questions. Uh, now I'll discuss my findings. So um, my first research question, you know, were what are the obstacles associated with former and current gang members seeking a higher education? So a lot of uh, pretty much everyone that I interviewed discussed the negative experience with educators in K through 12, you know, they were labeled in criminal ways, they were subject to law enforcement, and they didn't have engaging learning experiences. Um, here's a quote from James. Sitting in the office is like sitting in a holding tank or sitting on the third floor when they question you downtown. That's what that reminds me of. I was always being questioned, criminalized or dehumanized from the time that I can remember when it comes to school. They didn't really care and I was very smart too though. Unfortunately, the findings in higher education mirror the ones observed in K through 12 as it relates to barriers and being labeled. Um, here's a quote from Troy. Certain individuals, certain teachers, before they even knew I was a student, treated me like I would never be anything not knowing that I'm already on the path to try to get a higher education. So they would just treat me the same way as if I were in first through 12th grade, like I'm not supposed to be in higher education. Um, and then another finding I found um, related to my first research question, you know, was that many of the gang affiliated uh, individuals felt that the, that label prevented them from forming positive relationships with professors and peers. They also reported a lack of support groups. Here's a quote from Paul. I think one thing, I think professors, they don't realize 
I think the big difference between community college and a university, the teachers at community college know what the students are going through, but then at the university, I think the teachers don't take that into consideration. And um, I found one in the social um, as related to my uh, research question number one. Um, you know, despite their accomplishments and lack of criminal behavior, they struggle to find employment, life assisting resources, and general acceptance into mainstream society. Uh, many of my participants, you know, had uh, participated in diversity panels and uh, still couldn't find jobs on campus. Um, because of their background. Here's a quote from Kenneth. You guys are giving me a hard time and stopping me from working for a crime that happened when I was 17 years old and I didn't even do it. You guys are holding that over my head and basically put me into a second class citizenship. That's enough for a lot of individuals to go on a downward spiral when you're going to school. I'm like, well, what the hell am I going to community college for and trying to be an upstanding citizen and do everything right if I can't even get a job? And um, my second research question was, what factors contribute to the former and current gang members' persistence and success in education? So, you know, there, there wasn't too many, but the, the impact that, you know, social networks and organizations had on, on people was nothing short of life-changing. Um, and for the most part, it was local community organizations or it was um, uh, organizations on campus. Here's a quote from George. Underground scholars helped inspired me into seeing that I could get my PhD, no matter what my background was. They uplifted me and empowered me by helping embrace being formerly incarcerated and empowered me to speak up against all the stigmas and obstacles that exist in society. And then lastly, um, what can educators and community organizations do to help former and current gang members, students succeed in higher education? You know, I found many, uh, findings, but for the purpose of my paper, I only cited two. So the first one is avoid labeling gang affiliated students as criminals or problems. Here's a quote from Kenneth, keep your energy pure and don't be so quick to label individuals or call law enforcement or the school to police and speed up that school to prison pipeline. Individuals that come from these backgrounds, we are successful too, and we do amazing things, but they just gotta take more of initiative to understand more instead of just trying to label somebody. And then the second one was humanize or validate the self image and potential of all students. Here's a quote from Michelle. We definitely should understand what a gang member looks like. I think that people have this predisposition. And once you tell them your communities and where you're from, immediately another wall is brought up in or when you're having these conversations, the stigma is there. They are still a person, still human, and you can't dehumanize someone just based off any type of label that someone decides to brand them. I think that's important. Um, so uh, wrapping it up, um, you know, uh, my, my paper is 86 pages, um, you know, but for a presentation, I had to kind of consolidate everything. Uh, but when you kind of look at everything and, and you look at the findings from the interviews, um, you see that the school to prison pipeline was doing exactly what it was intended to do for students of color. Um, everybody in my study was um, discriminated at an early age. I had a person that I interviewed um, who talked about, and, and I'm sure people here can relate, um, not putting your name on a piece of paper and getting an F and, you know, just thinking about how professors in, in higher education do the same thing. Um, you know, you're late on an assignment um, and, and taking points off and things like that. Um, participants were not given the second chances, humanizing treatment and reasonable, reasonable disciplinary measure, measures. Um, and, and that's a perfect example. He didn't put his name on the paper. He received an F. Um, I had other participants talk about, um, you know, uh, cops on campus, um, sitting in uh, the office, just, you know, bored in class, talking a lot and things like that. So um, because of that, they had to sit in the office. Um, and then, um, you know, unable to connect with teachers in a meaningful way. So starting from, uh, you know, K through 12, uh, this followed them, you know, to higher education. And unfortunately, um, in higher education, that stigma and lack of support, you know, followed them. I have participants talking about having tattoos or once professors knew that they were gang affiliated or formerly incarcerated, 
you know, um, professors felt intimidated or, or um, you know, students didn't feel comfortable in, in office hours and things like that. Um, and then um, what I really want to, um, what I really tried to stress in my paper is, is active and former gang members as the solution. You know, I talked a lot about, um, and which I'm really excited. I saw um, Juan Flores, who I cited in my paper. A lot of the people that I interviewed who are writing their own research papers, um, you know, um, kind of changing the narrative, you know, on uh, what it means to be a gang member. And, um, um, you know, um, and then these are just my research questions revisited. Um, I was able to successfully answer all of them. Um, and like I said, um, unfortunately, uh, I couldn't include everything uh, that I wanted to. And then uh, these were kind of the recommendations um, from me and as well as my participants, um, which is like kind of obvious, but it was uh, provide on and off campus support groups. Um, a lot of individuals talk about how um, now that they're starting to see their campuses be more, you know, inclusive and, and, and including them in the conversation. And then uh, second chances and hiring practices, um, you know, what is the message, you know, if they can't get a job on campus? And then ultimately changing public policies, looking at local and state definitions of gang members. And then for future research, you know, pro-gang narratives. And, and what I mean by that is, you know, like I know people that I interviewed are, are already doing their own research. And, and just a lot of the research that I found, you know, was just focused on their, you know, perceived criminality. Um, there wasn't really anything out there um, done by gang members themselves. Um, the ones that I did find, you know, I did was able to cite in my paper. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Those are the resources that I used. Um, these are the individuals that I was able to interview, you know, so I want to thank them. And, um, you know, just a little bit, uh, I'll go ahead and close this, uh, a little bit more about my study. Um, I'm going to do a new share. Show video. But um, unfortunately, um, my study was initially denied. Um, and I didn't really know much about writing a thesis. You know, I just, um, you know, I'm kind of the first one in my family to, to get a master's degree. So um, I just thought I was writing a paper. Um, and then I do my lit review, and then you go up for approval uh, from IRB, and uh, they denied my study. Um, and said it would have to go up for review because I was interviewing gang members. Um, and um, they basically put gang members in the same um, population as they would uh, prisoners. Um, so because of that, um, you know, they said, uh, we, mo we most likely won't, ha uh, you, won't, you won't have to do, you won't be able to do this study. Um, so maybe you can do formerly incarcerated or you can do former gang members. Um, and I told my participants and they were like, good luck. Um, so um, I was like, you know what? I've gotten this far, I did my lit review. It was already like 30 pages in. And I was like, how come no one told me this before? You know, um, so I, I reached out to everyone that I could. And basically um, they told me to write some talking points and, and just try to fight it. So I met with the director of IRB and uh, basically told her what I was trying to do. And, you know, I basically told her, you know, we're trying to change the narrative of what it means to be a gang member. A gang member doesn't have to mean, you know, uh, somebody that's going to shoot you or steal from you or whatever you think gang members do. You know, all of my people that I'm interviewing are in college um, or have recently graduated. Um, and uh, she said, we'll probably still have to put it up for review and get a lawyer and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, can I have some sociologists on the panel? Um, and this all happened over break, uh, Christmas break. So I was kind of nervous, already thinking of new topics, um, trying to figure out what I was going to do. Um, but they end up approving it. Um, they just made me, uh, soften the language a little bit. Um, so instead of gang affiliated individuals, they wanted me to say gang affiliated students. So I had to really emphasize that they were all in college throughout my, uh, paper and throughout my interview questions and things like that. Um, so that just reflects the biases in society, you know, that are against gang members. Um, so it was definitely a trip um, and a crazy experience, um, but I'm glad that I got 
to do the paper and, and, you know, thankful for all the people that I was able to interview. You know, like I said, everyone that I interviewed identified as a current gang member, except for one. Um, and then I just want to show a short clip uh, from Boston and Cornered, because this is like one of the, the few organizations. I mean, we do have San Diego Pillars of the Community, but I found this one uh, unique because they pay gang members to go to college. So I'll show the clip. Um, Gabrielle, I, I don't think the sound is working, unfortunately. You guys can't hear? No. Seems like a, some people were, I can't hear it, and some other people were not able to hear it. Oh, sorry about that. I, I, I just unshared because I don't know how to do the sound. I don't have earphones on though. Oh, was it because my thing was muted? So it looks like you have to share your sound as well. Um, okay, let me see if I can figure it out. If not, it's okay. Uh, Can you guys hear now? Yeah, that's good. All right, cool. cool. I grew up in the system. When I was seven, I was placed in my first foster home. My sister got shot when she was 12 years old. I was 13, I was right there. My father went to jail when I was five. He got out when I was 21. When my grandmother's house got raided. They found a lot of guns and drugs and stuff in the house. I didn't care about school. I, my, my main focus when I was a kid was, I just want to figure out how I'm going to go home. How am I going to get back? All right, that's the wrong video. <laughs> mm. There it is. Our urban communities are not places of true opportunity. Our neighborhoods are held back by gang violence, where 1% of the population commits 50% of homicides, and 5% of street corners are home to 70% of violent crime. This level of trauma makes it impossible for individuals to thrive. What if we turn to gang leaders as the solution? 
The Uncornered Movement believes the way to end generational urban poverty is simply by ending gang violence, and we can do that. Gang members, who we call core influencers, can make that change. They move from the corner to college and influence their crews to do the same through three simple techniques. Hire former gang leaders to serve as mentors to active gang members, set and hold high expectation of college graduation for all, and invest. Have the courage to pay gang members to give them the opportunity to make the right choices. When we do that, things change, people succeed, crews turn to positive actions, and our world looks different. Here's what happens. 80% drop in recidivism, 70% college matriculation, and four crews that have turned from chaos and fear to opportunity and success. When Uncornered works, when we have the courage to shift autonomy to core influencers, our communities succeed. So, um, you know, that was uh, one organization that I found. And, and what I liked is I interviewed them, but, you know, they kept it 100 in the interview. And, and you know, um, I interviewed one of the college um, readiness advisors, and he was like, I'm going to keep it 100. I'm still an active gang member. Um, you know, I'm still from where I'm from, but I'm out here just trying to change the narrative. And, you know, they basically were like the people identifying who should be on the database. They don't really know. And all of that stuff about former and current gang, current gang member is, um, you know, just about language and, and just, to, you know, to make it acceptable to people. And then uh, just real quick, I want to show a, a small clip of um, a brother that I interviewed. Um, his name is uh, DeAndre, and he's currently working on his master's. And um, because of he, because he was documented as a gang member, he was sentenced um, to 11 years in prison at the age of 17 for a crime he did not commit. Here's a brief uh, story, his story. Right now we're at uh, the infamous 30 second and commercial and stuff. This is where I lost 11 years of my life ultimately to the prison system. My name is DeAndre Brooks. I'm a 30 year old African American, born and raised in San Diego. Went through a whole lot growing up. I was placed in group homes, foster homes. I turned to the streets, gang banging. That's where I felt that love and that connection that was missing, that part of me at the time kind of started off on a downward spiral. The way you talk about it, this was the youth center right here, right? <laughs> at 16, DeAndre was hanging out at the trolley station when two of his friends robbed two people waiting for a train. DeAndre was arrested for the robbery. One of the victims uh, corroborated my story and was like, that's the guy that just stood there the whole time and didn't do anything, but the judge said I was acting in concert. I was unaware of how uh, being tried as an adult worked having a strike on your record, how that would impact my life later on down the line. So they offered me a deal for a strike in probation. I'm thinking that's just it, it's one strike. A year later, just being at the trolley station at the wrong time meant DeAndre was sent to state prison. I came from a San Diego High football game with a friend of mine, got off the train. Somebody had already been beaten up here. It's just a fight. And uh, when I got to the scene, the police came and they arrested me and they were, uh, they, like I said, they took me down to the police station, showed me some pictures that said, we know it's a good possibility it wasn't you, but if you don't cooperate with us, we're getting a West Coast Crip game member off the streets. I mean, that's how they felt, felt about the situation. They didn't care. They really weren't trying to figure out whether or not I did it or not. Ultimately, you know, they just wanted that case. So this is, uh, this is where I lost 11 years of my life at. It's actually my first time coming back up here since I've been home and I've been home for three years. So kind of got mixed feelings right now and everything about being here. DeAndre was 17 years old when he was sent to prison. The first five or six years were definitely hard. Uh, riots, fights, witnessing stabbings all the time on a regular basis. You become kind of like numb to it. I mean, I learned how to make a knife, obviously. Uh, I learned how to politic with the best of them in there in terms of just, you know, all the race stuff, all the gang stuff. I learned how to be an inmate, a prisoner. It's really no, no forms of rehabilitation there. They just either keep you in a cell or let you go out to the yard to go work out and wait for a riot or something to take place and stuff. That's, it's kind of really scary in there in, in a sense of that because you're just out there just standing around. Anything could happen. You're not really learning anything. They took away a lot of the vocational um, classes. I was taking college courses at first. They even took the funding and cut the funding for that away. And then you're just sitting there stuck. I've sent you this is uh, for the Leader Academy. Right now I'm a um, case manager for at-risk youth. 
So I like to share my story as much as I can. We also got him um, getting ready to go to barber college and stuff right now. We have uh, we have a barber college program. But he really set me up for the uh, barber school at Cal Jobs over here. He uh, helped me up with that, and they gave me a call and everything, and they sent me up for the tuition and everything. And he didn't want to really call for them to be told for me to get started. So like I said, like that's a big. Start. I just try to stay on them a lot of times. You know, you kind of have the um, the tendency to slack off a little bit if you don't have the right people in your corners and the right support system. This is Dayshell. This is O'Shea. They're part of the Metro program. So what you guys got going on today and everything, man? And you can just tell the, the lack of funding that's around here. Uh, we need youth centers. We just need resources and stuff. We need opportunities being provided to these kids to give them something else to do besides just running around the Logan Heights community. Oh, I also like to put focus on just getting your education, oh, okay. education and attainment. I mean, that's, that's the basis of changing your whole life. Where do you uh, see yourself going the next couple years? I, I want to go to City College. Probably after go to um, Navy. Well, I'm happy y'all want to go to City College and everything. Now, I hope it's because of me. You know, I graduate from there this semester. What would have worked better for me would have been being part of a program that I'm part of right now as far as being a case manager working here, having positive role models and people of influence in my life, and just having an opportunity to be shown right from wrong is something different. Because a lot of times I think um, kids that are caught up in this lifestyle and come from our communities that we come from, they don't get exposed to anything different. Everything is kind of like mystic in a way to them. Like if you start talking about a higher education, if you start talking about opening up a business, something as simple as that, it's like mystic because you don't know, you don't have any examples or anybody around you to just be like, hey, this is how you do that, and then it becomes easier. Definitely. What do you like, think having a hundred of him around will do to this oh, community? man, everybody will be up here sooner or later. Okay. <laughs> 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 be up here sooner or later, though. But he's a good dude, though. He, he really likes to help people out, you know, because... He said, like, you know, a lot of people out here don't waste your time out here game banging, doing stupid stuff. Like, all that stuff, that's going to waste. Like all right, so that was just, um, you know, a small uh, clip of uh, DeAndre's story. And uh, like I said, I interviewed him and... Uh, he was sentenced to 11 years at the age of 17, um, just because he was documented as a gang member. Um, now that brother's out and he's, um, you know, he's doing really well. He has his own business. He's uh, working on his master's and just really out here, you know, changing the narrative. Um, now I just uh, want to bring in uh, brother Chris, um, who I also interviewed um, just to kind of, you know, share a little bit about his experiences. He just um, graduated from SDSU uh, and got a degree in business management and a minor in marketing. Um, let's see, I think he's on. Yep, yep. Thank you, uh, I appreciate you uh, joining me. Um, so the first question I wanted to ask, um, and, and really um, I'm asking this question because um, you know, my whole focus was changing the narrative of what it meant to be a gang member. And a lot of people that I interviewed, um, you guys didn't see each other's, you know, transcripts and, and didn't see, uh, you know, each other's uh, interviews. And basically you guys all had similar questions. Um, so I wanted to see if you can talk a little bit about, you know, how there's this perception that everything associated with gangs, you know, is negative and just talk about your experiences you know, um, in your community and, and just a little bit about the positive aspects of being a part of a gang? Well, the negative aspect happens because, you know, in, in history and what the media puts out there from like what people see, you know, they only show like when people get shot, when people is dying, um, you know, they even label us as street terrorists, stuff like that. Um, I think it's kind of unfair because, um, a lot of people, you know, they either join a gang because, you know, a lot of people, they're born into it, you know, that's all they really know. You know, there's a few people out there that do make that decision, you know, because that's what they want to do. But a lot of the times as youth, you know, we're kind of confused. We're just trying to find an identity for ourselves, you know, um, we're kind of like forced into these situations. Um, but once I, you know, I'm formally incarcerated as well. Um, so, that's one of the main reasons that I kind of went to school because um, I wanted to make something out of myself. Um, 
and even on school campus, um, it was kind of different. You know, it's kind of hard to relate to people at times um, until I found our own an organization that I was in. And then, you know, I found some like-minded people. Um, I was in the Emoja program and I found some like-minded people um, like my brother, Aaron, um, his brother, Alonzo, um, DeAndre, uh, Flacco, you know, we all have similar backgrounds. So, we, you know, we all lean, lean um, on one another. But, you know, at, at the same time, we all, well, me, I try to shed that negative image and show, you know, there is a, um, positive side, you know, a lot of people in gangs is the smartest people that you'll ever come across. Um, a lot of us, you know, a lot of people are natural born leaders at the same time. Um, you know, we just needed something, we just needed to focus our energy on something else. And once we find our avenue, um, anything is possible, you know? So I know a lot of people that's, you know, um, business owners, um, they, they have their own small businesses. I know people that become in leadership positions and like, um, union jobs. Um, I know people that wrote books, um, you know, anything is possible. Um, and just for me, I'm trying to shed that, you know, I got my bachelor's degree. Um, I got, I just got this job as a um, sales rep um, in a few years. I'm about to probably go back and get my master's. I want to go to an HBCU and get my master's. I think that's important um, to shed light on that as well. Um, and yeah, that's all I have for that question. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, can you uh, just briefly, um, you know, talk about some of the barriers you faced, um, you know, on your path to higher education? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, before I started school, um, there's a bunch of barriers, you know. Some people, they didn't get what I was doing. Um, they thought I was just wasting my time. There was like, he just going to school for like no reason. Um, but until I started doing like little things that started adding up and adding up, um, a lot of people did see why I was going to school. And then a lot of my homies, they could, they, they respect me for that. They respect me for, you know, being my own man. And a lot of my friends now, they, um, they on their way to school or they taking avenues to start their own things. You know, they come to me and ask me about stocks. They asked me about um, how to gain real estate. They asked me how to do, um, start a small business um, or how to become a, a start your own nonprofit. Um, and, you know, if you ask the average person on the street, they don't, they're not gonna think that we have these type of conversations with each other, but we do, you know, all the time. Um, you know, we're not out here just trying to run amok and cause damage and destruct people's lives. You know, when I see my young homies out there, I tell them like, hey man, what is y'all doing? Um, I say, if you're going to be from this gang, I'll like, you know, go ahead, do your thing, represent it to the fullest, but there's other avenues for you, man. Finish school, you know, you can still be down and do it in a positive way. Um, but some of the barriers I faced um, was a lot, especially when I was on parole going to city college. Um, I had to ask my parole officer permission for every single thing. Anytime uh, we went on a trip, I had to ask him permission. I basically had to sell him a dream on while I'm, why I'm going. Um, a lot of the times they didn't believe me. So I had to ask, you know, like my professors, you know, can you talk to my parole officer, you know, just to say the same thing that I basically said to him for them to believe me. Um, so those were some of the barriers that I, um, that happened to me. Yeah, most definitely. Um, yeah, so I interviewed Brother Chris and, and his experiences mirrored everyone that I interviewed, you know, um, the barriers um, they faced, um, being formally incarcerated, being gang affiliated, um, and all of them, um, you know, kind of had the same definition of what it meant to be a gang member and what it meant to to change the narrative and and out here doing positive stuff. Um, he just graduated, you know, with his bachelor's. He's a father, um, and and out here trying to make change in the community. Um, so I guess we can open it up for questions. Um, uh, if anyone has any questions for me uh, or for Chris. Uh, oh, another uh, IRB thing too was I couldn't interview my people on uh, on camera, so that was weird. And some of them I knew. I was like, "This is so weird." Um, but they were like, "For the protection of of the people you're interviewing, you can't interview on, them on camera." Um, and I tried to fight that too, but you know, I was like, "You gotta you gotta pick your battles." <laughs> so I was like, "Let me just do this study," but. Um, 
It's like I know some of these people and they're gonna be looking at me weird. Like, what you mean I can't interview on camera? But it, it all worked out. So if anyone has any uh, uh, questions, you know, shoot them. What was your um, major motivation and life experience that made you want to change the narrative and, and bring change? Um, so really, um, I think just, um, you know, uh, growing up in Southeast um, and then also just um, being a part of organizations, um, seeing the people that come through fillers um, and seeing what they were doing, going to college. Um, and then uh, also the people that I worked with, um, I was working in the juvenile court and community schools um, where I graduated and, um, you know, kind of just looking at uh, the struggles that they faced um, as youth um, to get their high school diploma. Um, but unfortunately, it's also hard to uh, interview youth um, because of consent forms. And, and you know, they're also a, a risk population. Um, so I thought what other perfect population to interview is people that are already in college. Um, when I met with my professor for the first time, um, it was pretty funny because she was like, uh, I don't know how many gang affiliated individuals you know. And I was like, uh, a lot. <laughs> Um, like my whole family and uh, I was like and I know people that are in college and, and who are gang members and they're getting their education um, and I also wanted to do people who you know may not have made it but that would have just made my paper also a lot longer um, because I think that's important too is, is to highlight why these people are not making it you know what are the obstacles um, that they're facing that prevents them um, and, and that's actually more interesting to see. Um, but uh, my professor was like, oh, you should focus on the positive aspects and, and blah, blah, blah. Um, and your paper is gonna be too long. And you know, all this uh, stuff that you have to follow um, that I didn't know that things were so rigid, you know, um, in my master's program. And, and you only have 20 minutes to present and you can't have all these findings and you can't do this and you can't do that. So um, I, I just kept it at people that were in college or had recently graduated. Thank you. I think the material is powerful. Thank you. Um, someone, wrote a, someone wrote a question in the chat, if you wanted to take a look at that one. Hey, thank you so much for your research. Um, I was wondering uh, if you could like maybe talk about maybe some future research around the work that you did. Maybe uh, you recognize some gaps that you couldn't like uh, put up in your research brief that maybe future researchers could, uh, could expand on. Yeah, so um, honestly, when I, when I um, started this, I couldn't find anything um, really on gang members and education. Um, you know, like I was saying, there was very few organizations and, you know, there's a reason for that too, right? Um, the people that we see as the solution, um, people don't see them as deserving and, and not a lot of organizations are working with these individuals. Um, so um, gangs and education, I couldn't find anything really um, too many articles. I know I reached out to you. You hooked me up with Dr. Rios, uh, who hooked, he hooked me up with some people. Um, and really the people that are doing the work are, are active gang members or people who are, are identifying as former gang members. Um, so as far as the gaps, like I, I honestly, for my, my recommendations, I just put future, you know, pro gang narratives and, and hopefully we see more people um, who are gang members doing the research and, and things like that. Um, you know, you guys writing about your lived experiences uh, and stuff like that. Um, but really there was there was really no information out there. A lot of the, the research that I found, you know, focused on crime, criminal activity, um, you know, deviant behavior. Why do you join gangs? Um, you know, and it was pretty much uh, the same across the board, um, you know, for what they, what they believe. Um, but but they have no idea, um, and that's why I really wanted to focus on individuals who were either gang members or, or affiliated. Um, I did see a question in the chat. Um, um, you know, honestly, they they um, 
they wanted me to soften the language because um, they just, uh, they put uh, gang members in the same population as prisoners. And, you know, I had some talking points and I, I just was like, I don't get how they're prisoners. They're not prisoners, they're not committing crimes. Um, and I just expressed that, um, you know, to them when I uh, presented, uh, you know, to IRB. Um, and, and because of COVID, you know, everything was over Zoom and, and I just presented my case. And I said, you know, they're, they're not, uh, they're just proud to be from their hoods, you know, and then their barrios and their communities, you know. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we went from there and uh, she said that um, possibly have a lawyer. I asked for some sociologists because a lot of my research focuses, you know, I use sociologists and uh, they said, yeah. And I asked if I can bring a professor in uh, and they did say, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, I was able to move forward. Uh, let me see if I see another question I can answer real quickly. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, they probably were just scared, though, you know. Uh, that's where a lot of people were telling me. They were like, they probably never had a study like this. Um, um, so they're just trying to be, uh, you know, cautious as possible. Um, and, you know, gang members scares people. They hear that word and, and scare people. Um, so what I did was, and I invited the director of IRB, and she came to my presentation. Um, you know, uh, she thanked me for the opportunity, you know, just uh, to, to change the narrative. So I don't know if it was if it was real or not, but she was there. And, um, you know, she just talked about, uh, you know, she was just like, I'm thankful that you pushed and you did this study. You know, you said something really interesting. You said uh, that gang members are classified uh, writer in the same category as prisoners. Mm -hmm. And when I like when I wrap my mind around that, um, like, dang, we are like really like in prison in our communities. Like we're not free. Like we're the, the cops the hyper police us like they roll up on us and search us. They you know what I'm saying? Like so it's like we are pretty much imprisoned in our own communities. We got these injunctions on our on our communities, on our neighborhoods that are centered on on us and we're their target in those injunctions and and uh and so yeah and that's that's a trip that they have us classified as as prisoners you know yeah it was crazy too because what i told them i was like it's really unfair that you don't even read my paper you just read how i'm gonna do my study my interview questions and then you make a decision based on that because i was like if you read my lit review i'm highlighting exactly what you guys are doing to me I was like, I talk about the biases against gang members and you guys are knowing exactly what I'm talking about. Um, so I was like, maybe you should go read my paper and then, and then make a decision, you know? But I was like, damn, I'm doing exactly what you guys are, are you know? You guys are reflecting the biases that exist in society. Um, but uh, yeah, it's definitely a trip. I started looking up the, uh, you know, you take a little quick course, uh, IRB course to get a certificate to do your study. So I started going in there, looking up what it means to be a prisoner. And I'm like, gang members nowhere fit in this. So how are you guys deciding that they do? Um, did anyone else have any quick questions? I want to thank uh, you know everyone for coming through everyone that I interviewed that made this possible all the organizations you know Flacco Alonzo my cousin Aisha Chris uh, thank you for hopping on and, and letting me interview you uh, I appreciate it somebody got a question I think it was Zachary Oh, hey, yeah, no, and I'll try to make it quick. I was just thinking about the IRB thing, and I've had problems with them, too. Um, I, I interview formerly incarcerated people, and I was just going to comment that one of the things that might be behind that is it, it is really interesting what you're talking about, that there's some ambiguity for the IRB.
because in my experience, they're covering one of their main concerns is keeping the university from getting sued based on past abuses. You know, they're, they're, they frame it as they're interested in protecting you from abuse or the participants from abuse and you from abusing them. But what they're really concerned about is getting sued. And so then you get all kinds of irrational behavior when you're trying to interview and it's people in groups they haven't dealt with before. So that was all I had. So thank you. Great yeah. presentation too. I, I would say like, great presentation. Thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. I was like, this straight up feels like a um, what is those documentaries? The um, the stuff, the gangland documentaries. I was like, that's what it feels like when I'm interviewing my folks. Uh, thank you, Nisha. I appreciate it. She was my counselor at City College. Shout out to Nisha. Yeah, and a lot of my, the people I interviewed, I also went to community college. So, you know, I found that as like a pathway, um, you know, and a lot of people talked about how that was, um, they felt more comfortable and more connected to the professors and the, the people on the community college versus a university setting. So shout out to uh, City College and Nisha. But that's it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, check out the other uh, great workshops. You know, I was able to attend some yesterday. And, and like I said, I'm honored to, to, to the people that I was citing and interviewed are presenting. 